Go ahead and hit start. The underlying conditions result in inflammation, gut dysbiosis, and a weakened immune system. And so, you know, really focusing on, as Dr. Robinson said, the pillars of, of health, we have so much power um, as individuals to reduce our risk, not only for those chronic diseases, but to be really in a good situation for fighting off infections, um, you know, should a virus or bacterial infection um, impact our, our health or if we're infected with something, we want our immune system to be in its best shape. And so it's clear that the lifestyle choices that prevent and reverse those chronic health conditions are so important for keeping our immune system healthy and helping us fight off those acute infections as well. Um, so I'm a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and that's an evidence-based practice of helping individuals and families adopt and sustain healthy behaviors that affect health and quality of life. So specifically, we're looking at healthy eating, physical activity, uh, managing stress uh, through using things like meditation and mindfulness, um, having healthy relationships, sleep, and avoiding harmful substances, so things like tobacco and drugs and alcohol. And so today we're gonna to be talking a whole lot about nutrition, but truly all of these pieces of the puzzle are important. And you know, diet is, is absolutely critical, but even if somebody is eating a super healthy, uh, nutritious diet, if the, some of those other pieces of the puzzle aren't, aren't in place, if their sleep isn't uh, adequate, if they're not moving their bodies, um, we can still see breakdowns in the immune system and um, there is risk for those chronic diseases. So according to um, the 2014 World Health Organization report on non-communable diseases, so those diseases that can be prevented, the modifiable behaviors linked uh, to over 16 million deaths annually are tobacco and alcohol use, physical inactivity, and our unhealthy diet. And so let's define an unhealthy diet. What does that mean? Um, it is one that's low in fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes, and one that's high in processed foods, animal products, refined sugars, and salt. And so a healthy diet looks like this, lots of bright, vibrant colors um, that are really the making up uh, the crux of one's diet versus this, where you can see that, you know, the vegetables are truly like a condiment to an otherwise um, unhealthy diet that's really high in saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, and so on. All right, so now that we know what a healthy diet is, um, if we look at what we're actually eating in the United States, you can see that it's not those healthy foods. Uh, close to 70% of the calories that Americans consume are coming from those unhealthy sources, added fats, oils, sugars, and animal products, and just a really um, measly 9% of the calories that we consume are coming from really healthy whole foods like vegetables, fruits, and legumes. So one of the things that I love most about lifestyle medicine and um, plant-based nutrition is that there's not a different prescription for different conditions of the body. Like truly our mental health, our physical health are connected and the same lifestyle choices that are good for your heart, are good for your kidneys, are good for your brain. And so it really is understanding um, how a human being is designed to eat. And that's what we're gonna be jumping into a lot here, really looking how um, whole plant-based foods are, are meant and designed for humans to consume and should be making up um, the bulk of, of individuals' diets. And 
they work so well, plant-based diets work so well because they get to the root cause of all of these different uh, diseases. So truly at the root cause of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, um, there's inflammation, there's gut dysbiosis, there's oxidative stress, there's this lipotoxicity that we'll talk a little bit more about. And so when you're fueling your body with the right foods, um, those, those things will be reversed, reduced, and your body will heal. So here's where it was really challenging for me to kind of narrow down uh, the research because in any one of these topics that I'm going to talk about, there's just so many fascinating and awesome studies that show how well a plant-based diet works for um, preventing disease and reversing disease when people are already have um, a chronic condition. So if we start by jumping into heart disease, uh, back in 1990, Dr. Dean Ornish published, published his um, groundbreaking lifestyle heart trial results. And in that, he randomized people with um, advanced coronary artery disease, so people who had severe blockages in arteries in their heart, to either an experimental program or a control group. And those in the experimental group were eating low-fat vegetarian diets, doing like a modest amount of exercise daily, uh, managing stress, and if they were smokers, they, they quit smoking. And after just one year of following those uh, lifestyle modifications, uh, no medication interventions, no uh, surgical interventions, the people in that experimental group saw their cholesterol drop on average 24% with their bad or LDL cholesterol falling 37%, uh, weight loss of 22 pounds, um, and the most remarkable of all is that there was a reversal of how much the arteries were clogged in these participants. 82% um, of the participants saw a reversal in the narrowing of their arteries. So just to you know, give you a picture of what that looks like, here's the, the normal artery. And you know, when your artery is, is clogged with, with plaque, that um, is deposited over many, many years. Um, that's what prevents the blood from flowing freely and uh, significantly increases the risk of a heart attack or stroke. So this study was remarkable in that it was the first showing that lifestyle uh, behaviors alone can actually reverse that plaque buildup. All right, so if we wanna think about what happens, right, because that plaque buildup occurs over many years, many decades, um, but we, we know that inflammation, we know that injury to our arteries can actually occur immediately after we eat a meal. Um, and if you can see these test tubes here, the one that is labeled as black beans or the plant-based meal, you can see that blood sample. If you take the blood sample of someone um, after they've eaten a plant-based meal versus a meat-based meal. In this picture here, the foods being compared were a black bean burrito versus a chicken burrito. Uh, the blood of the person who consumed the black bean burrito is much clearer. So the viscosity or the thickness of your blood actually increases um, after you eat a meal that's particularly high in saturated fat. And and that matters because that blood thickness is um, slows the rate of which blood can flow through the arteries. It can lead to increased blood pressure and um, just slow the delivery of oxygen and nutrients to muscles and tissues. So what's wonderful is that our bodies are able to heal themselves if we give them the right conditions to do so. And often what I talk to my patients about is that if we're, you know, when we go to bed at night and one of the wonderful things about sleep, and I'm sure Dr. Robinson talks a lot about this with his patients, is that as we're sleeping, our bodies repair damage that has been done throughout the day. And, you know, we want, 
we want our bodies, we want to wake up and, and we want to continue our day in a way that, that limits the damage that's being done. And what we're putting into our mouth every meal, every time we eat, can make a huge difference in how much um, inflammation we experience and how much damage we do to our bodies throughout the day. So, you know, just as an example, you can imagine like if you wake up and you eat a, a breakfast sandwich, you know, you're stopping at a fast fast food uh, drive through you know, that, that meal has a lot of fat. And so that, that damage that you saw in the previous slide with the the blood being more thick and immediately there's damage done to the epithelial cells of your arteries and there's inflammation. Um, that happens within 20 minutes of eating that meal and it takes several hours for that inflammation to resolve. And typically what happens is, is as soon as that inflammation is, is resolved, it's time to eat again. And what so many Americans are doing are eating another meal that's high in saturated fat that causes that inflammation all over again. And just when that inflammation is starting to resolve again, it's time to eat it again. And so that process, um, we're never allowing our bodies the time to heal themselves um, because of the foods that we're consistently eating. So um, foods that are specifically helpful for lowering blood pressure include um, whole plant-based foods, foods like fruits and vegetables, whole unprocessed grains, uh, flax seeds, and other seeds, but there's numerous research studies showing benefits of flax seeds in particular for lowering blood pressure. So not this. And you also want to beware of salt, um, not just because many people are aware that a high salt diet increases blood pressure. It also impairs artery function and promotes inflammation. Um, so here are the top sources of sodium in the US diet. Um, take a look. I don't know if you notice anything what you see. Uh, you definitely don't see fruits and vegetables on there. Those legumes are whole grains. It's all processed and animal-based foods. So those foods that are truly making up the crux of the standard American diet are the highest sources of sodium. All right, and so one, one recommendation I have here that I don't have in the slide is when you're looking at a food label, um, a good way to keep your sodium intake below two uh, grams or 2,000 milligrams a day, which is often recommended. For some people, it's even less, 1,500 milligrams it might be. Um, you know, you might think on average, people might consume between 1,500 and 2,000 calories in a day. So if you compare the amount of sodium on that food label to the total calories per serving, and if the sodium is equal or, or less than the calories, that's kind of a good rule of thumb for keeping sodium intake low. Uh, another suggestion is not to add salt while you're cooking. Um, as you're cooking and you're adding salt, you don't taste that salt nearly as much as when you salt your food at the end. So it's really easy to add a lot of salt in the cooking process. You'll see on this list here, breads and rolls are the leading source of sodium in the US diet. And you might think mm, they, they don't um, necessarily taste salty. And that's because the salt is baked into those products. It's incorporated. Whereas if it was on the surface, you would taste it a lot more. So if you are going to add salt to your foods, I highly recommend waiting until after your meal is cooked and then adding it because you'll taste it a lot more when it's on the surface of the foods. Um, so often people think that physical activity is really important for lowering, lowering blood pressure and it certainly is and there are um, there's a whole host of benefits to moving your body every day for sure. Uh, but this study in particular fascinated me um, because it compared sedentary meat eaters who exercise less than one hour per week to omnivorous eaters, so people who are eating um, meat and plants, um, 
kind of your standard American diet, but also running close to 50 miles per week. So that's a lot of exercise. And then compared to people who eat exclusively plant-based who exercise less than one hour per week. And taking a look at their blood pressure, it's really interesting to see what happens. So certainly exercise um, resulted in a much healthier blood pressure than the person who is not moving and eating the standard American diet. But look at what happens to the blood pressure of somebody who doesn't move that much and eats an exclusively plant-based diet. It's the healthiest blood pressure of all of the groups. All right, so we're gonna move on a bit to diet and diabetes. And I think it's really important for people to understand the root cause of diabetes, specifically type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is, is different um, in its etiology. Uh, but for type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, the root cause is insulin resistance. And what that means is that there is a buildup of fat inside the muscle cells, inside the liver cells, inside the pancreatic cells. And uh, there's a picture here to describe this a little better. So this blue circle is depicting a muscle cell. And inside our muscle cells, we have mitochondria. They're like our cells' furnaces. So they're depicted by those brown dots that look like seeds. And those mitochondria are what can, are or what will take that glucose or the sugar that's in the blood in our blood after we eat, um, and and burn that sugar. Um, and in a healthy individual, in somebody who doesn't have uh, insulin resistance, our brain will sense the presence of gluco glucose in the blood, and our pancreas will secrete insulin. And insulin will attach to the receptors on our muscle cells. Uh, and that truly is um, what signals uh, reactions to occur to allow glucose to come inside the cells. So this, these yellow blobs that you can see, that's the fat that's inside our muscle cells. And when that fat and it, it's creates toxic compounds and interferes with insulin's ability to work. So in type 2 diabetes, for example, people are still secreting insulin. Um, the insulin is able to attach to those receptor cells, but that fat is blocking the reactions that need to occur. And so glucose stays outside the cells and in the bloodstream. And we've known for over 100 years that insulin resistance can be reversed, and it can often be reversed pretty quickly um, with dietary changes. And so some research suggests that, you know, if people lose enough weight, then type 2 diabetes can be reversed. Now, one study in particular published um, in 2018 uh, included 306 individuals and 49 primary care practices in Scotland and England. And these patients were um, randomized and uh, put into groups. And the experimental group was put on a very restrictive, a very calorie restrictive diet, so less than 900 calories. It was about 850 calories um, per day. And that went on for three to five months. And after those three to five months, foods were reintroduced and, you know, the goal was for people to eat in a healthy way so that they would keep the weight off long term. And what's interesting is that in, in this group, those people who lost the most weight, so people who, who achieved a weight loss of 15 or more kilograms, 86% of people who achieved that amount of weight loss reverse their diabetes in one year. And so you can see it's like stair steps. The less weight that people lost, the fewer of those people uh, saw complete reversal of diabetes at the end of that year long study. And so that's a great uh, indicator uh, how important weight loss is, right? Like 
reducing that fat storage for reversing insulin resistance. However, I would argue that we know that weight loss is is very challenging, especially in long-term weight loss. And that if there's a way for people to reverse insulin resistance in the absence of such a significant weight loss, might that, you know, not um, might that be a better plan? And so we have research indicating that when people are put on a diet that is predominantly plant-based and a diet that is weight maintaining, so this study. Um, did just that, where people were eating exclusively plant-based foods, lots of vegetables, beans, fruits, whole grains. And we're talking about people who had diabetes for over two decades. Um, some were injecting 20 units of insulin a day. And they were weighed every day so that if they lost weight, they had to eat more. So that truly the diet was weight maintaining to test this hypothesis here of whether or not it's the weight loss or the types of food that people eat that matter so much. Um, and on this weight maintaining whole food plant-based diet, the results were incredible. Average insulin requirements reduced by 60% and 50% of the participants were off insulin entirely in just 16 days. So that is really powerful and shows that, um, you know, truly our dietary pattern, the types of foods that we're consuming, not just the calories, matter. Uh, fiber seems to be a really strong indicator in uh, reducing risk of diabetes. And also in these studies, um, the study that I just referenced and, and many, many more, there have been so many studies published in just the past five years showing that uh, plant predominant or plant exclusive diets reverse type two diabetes. And those uh, study participants are eating really high fiber diets. So 65 plus grams of fiber a day appears to be a really strong marker uh, for diabetes reversal. And dietary fiber reduces the risk of so much more. So choosing foods high in fiber is setting you up for uh, lower cancer risk, lower heart disease risk, and definitely um, for a healthier weight too. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So what foods have fiber? That's what's important. What does a dietary pattern look like for someone to achieve a really high fiber, 40, 50, 60 grams of fiber a day. All of your whole plant-based foods have fiber. So fiber is only in plant-based foods. Um, your whole grains, your beans, your lentils, your peas tend to have the highest amounts of fiber. Fruits and vegetables absolutely contain fiber too, as do nuts and seeds. So on the opposite spectrum, animal-based foods have no fiber at all. Um, and I think it's important to talk about, you know, what about a low-carb diet for diabetes? Because it's, it's really very trendy and very popular right now for people to be following this type of diet. Um, and there are concerns with this. So sure, people can lose weight in the short term following a low carb diet and sometimes see uh, blood glucose improve, sometimes see blood pressure improve because of that weight loss. But long term, these high fat keto diets um, increase the risk of all cause mortality and they're not getting to the root cause of diabetes. So a low carbohydrate diet as a treatment for diabetes is treating the symptom. It's treating that high blood sugar, which is the symptom and not treating the insulin resistance. And so one of the things that we've done um, with patients that I work with um, is order a glucose tolerance test for them. So if they're following a keto diet, and they've seen their A1C come down, they've seen their blood glucose come down. Um, we wanna know what will happen if they challenge their, if, if they're challenged with a high carbohydrate intake, is their diabetes truly reversed or is it just that their blood sugar is low because they're not taking in um, very many carbohydrates in the day? A true ketogenic diet is very, very 
low in uh, carbohydrates and also low in protein. So what this graph is showing you is um, how your blood sugar is um, impaired on a high fat diet. So someone who's following a ketogenic diet, for example, and then is challenged by carbohydrates, that blood sugar is gonna go right up. And that's what we see um, in the practice where I work in, in Delaware, when we ask those people who've been following a ketogenic diet to go do a glucose tolerance test and then measure their blood glucose um, in a lab setting, it's high. Um, and just to put like a personal face to this, this is Bill. He is one of the patients who went through an eight week reverse diabetes program that I helped facilitate in Wilmington. And um, in a year, he lost almost a hundred pounds. So today, if I updated this, he's now um, lost over a hundred pounds. And his A1C went from a 7.2, which is in the range of diabetes to a 6.1, which is considered in the pre-diabetes range, an A1C over 5.7, from 5.7 to 6.4 is in the pre-diabetes range. Um, so he, what's really great is that he did that on less medication. So he's no longer taking medicine for his high cholesterol. He's no longer taking metformin for his diabetes. And I believe in another, so next month, he should be having his A1C checked again. And hopefully that A1C will be done even more. Um, so often I'm asked by people, you know, how am I gonna get protein on a plant-based diet? And I want to assure you, if that's a concern, that it shouldn't be, that Americans on average get more than adequate protein, even people who are following an exclusively plant-based diet um, get more than enough protein. And that protein is in every single whole plant-based food. So plants are the producers, they are the manufacturers of the essential amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins in our body. Um, there's no animal on the planet that makes those essential amino acids. So plants truly are um, the manufacturers of those essential amino acids. And if we're eating animals, they're like the middlemen. Um, all right. And while we live in a culture that really emphasizes animal-based protein, I know that I grew up um, you know, eating meat every day, maybe multiple times a day. And it's kind of like how we plan our meals in America. For many people, at least it's pick a meat and then pick the vegetables or the grains as side dishes. Um, and that's not a healthy way that um, this graph is showing um, how much uh, less risk there is for all of uh, less risk of death when you're replacing animal-based protein with plant protein. And that's looking at just replacing 3% of calories in a day coming from animal protein with plant pr protein. So, uh, you know, say you eat 2,000 calories in a day, replacing just 60 calories of animal-based protein with plant-based protein um, can dramatically reduce risk of death. And so, you know, doing more than that is even better. And the world's uh, largest organization of food and nutrition professionals, you know, clearly states in their position paper that uh, plant-based diets are nutritionally adequate for all stages of the life cycle. And so looking at uh, diet and cancer, uh, the American Institute for Cancer Research is one of the world's leading authorities on diet and cancer. And they state that a plant-based diet uh, cuts the risk of many cancers and other diseases as well. So again, we're not just trying to prevent one disease. When you understand that uh, we truly are, as humans, meant to thrive on these whole plant-based foods, then you're really slashing your risk of, of all chronic diseases, lowering inflammation, um, and just 
setting yourself up for a long and healthy life. Uh, so that same uh, lifestyle protocol that we saw uh, put to the test against heart disease was put to the test against prostate cancer. So men with prostate cancer were put on uh, a low fat vegetarian diet. Uh, they walked, they managed stress, they avoided tobacco. And um, in just a year, those men, so the men were randomized to either this healthy living group or the control group that just went along living their life, going, you know, the same as always going to their scheduled doctor's appointments. And in just a year, the men in that healthy living group saw their uh, PSA or their prostate specific antigen, which is a blood test that kind of measures, you know, prostate cancer may or may not be progressing. Um, the people in that, that healthy living group saw that number fall, whereas the control group saw it increase, of course, with, you know, making no lifestyle modifications. But this is really powerful because, you know, doing nothing other than changing lifestyle factors, uh, you know, is reversing that process of cancer progression. And uh, very, very powerful. And these are all things that any one of us can be doing, um, you know, making changes to how much we move, changing, uh, you know, our diets, um, very powerful impacts on our health. Uh, for women and men too, um, breast cancer risk can be reduced by 62% um, by doing these three simple uh, life, by making these three simple lifestyle changes. So limiting alcohol, uh, eating a plant-centered diet, and maintain, maintaining a normal body weight. Um, and truly for all cancers, maintaining a normal body weight or for multiple types of cancers, that's really, really important. And perhaps, um, you know, one of the, the most challenging things, at least in the patients that I work with, is, is weight loss. Um, so specifically foods that can cause cancer, we know processed meats, things like bacon, deli meat, sausage, pepperoni, these are group one carcinogens. And so there's enough research, there's enough evidence that shows that these foods not only increase the risk of cancer, but they cause cancer, specifically colorectal cancer. And that other types of meats, red meats, beef, lamb, and pork probably cause cancer. So, you know, even reducing your consumption of these foods is going to have a dramatic effect on your risk for cancer. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about soy foods and whether or not they're healthy. Uh, when it comes to cancer, they absolutely um, are linked to a reduced risk of breast, prostate, colon, lung, and endometrial cancers. And when women who have had breast cancer incorporate soy into their diet, so things like tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk, their uh, risk of breast cancer recurrence goes down. Uh, all right, so dairy is one of the hot topics uh, for sure in many of my conversations with patients. Um, and I think this picture kind of says it all. If we just think about what is the biological purpose of milk, whether it's cow's milk or human milk or dog milk or giraffe milk, that milk is meant to feed a baby and, and to make that baby grow very rapidly uh, in a short amount of time. And so we know that cow's milk is meant for baby cows. And there is research indicating that dairy consumption may increase cancer risk. Um, we also know that two out of three people worldwide develop lactose intolerance at some point in their life, uh, especially uh, people of color uh, have much higher rates of lactose intolerance. And so that's really a true indicator that, you know, we are not meant to continue consuming dairy uh, after infancy because our body stops producing the enzyme needed to break down lactose or the sugar that's found in milk. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about diet and obesity now. And 
Um, the way I think of this is that, you know, obesity is our reaction to our environment. It's the natural response to the environment that we live in. Um, you know, this picture is, I want you to think about like what it would be like if you lived in a time, if you lived in a place where you had to procure your food, where there were no grocery stores, where um, you spent a great deal of energy. So you were expending a lot of energy throughout the day in, in picking foods from the ground and hunting and gathering. And now, you know, fast forward, this is what our environment is like. And so it's so much different, but what hasn't changed in all of you know, this, this history is our brain and our anatomy and our physiology and our response to food. So our brains are naturally hardwired to crave the foods that pack in a lot of calories for a little amount of work because that, that works really great when, when you know, you're in, a, in an environment where truly you are eating every day to survive. And so now our environment is just packed full of really calorie dense foods that create a dopamine response in our brain that create these cravings and drive for wanting more and more of these foods. And so for weight loss, there are so many different types of diets that people try from paleo to the keto diet, South Beach, um, my favorite perhaps, this Hollywood cookie diet. You know, um, and the thing about diets is they work until they don't work, right? So often they're not sustainable and really looking at the overall dietary pattern. So they may be calorie restrictive or limiting a lot of foods. And for many people that's not sustainable. Um, and truly what matters is the quality of the calories that you are consuming. So 500 calories of fruits and vegetables, for example, is much, much different uh, than 500 calories of processed foods, of animal-based foods, of cheese. And this calorie density concept is my favorite way of approaching weight loss because the focus is on eating whole foods that fill you up for fewer calories. You can actually consume a larger quantity of food, a larger volume of food in a day uh, for fewer calories, but those calories also come packed full of nutrients, full of antioxidants, full of fiber. So the way calorie density works is when you compare food by weight, there's all kinds of interesting research on calorie density. Um, and these numbers on the graph are showing you on average how many calories there are in a pound of various types of food. So if you can imagine um, eating an entire pound of, of vegetables, that's a lot of food. And most vegetables are only 100 to 150 calories per pound and packed full of nutrients. So low calorie density foods, and I'm going to identify what foods are considered low in calorie density per multiple research studies. Um, they are high in fiber and they have a high water content. So they're bulky, they weigh a lot, they take up more space in your stomach, as you can see by this graph here, right? Like if you had 500 calories of fruits and vegetables, your stretch receptors in your stomach are gonna be activated. That's gonna send a message to your brain that you're full versus 500 calories of oil at the complete opposite spectrum on the calorie density scale, uh, that's only a few tablespoons of oil. It's not going to take up much room in your stomach. It's not going to provide you with fiber. It's not going to provide you with antioxidants and nutrients the way that plant-based foods do. So non-starchy vegetables, which are most vegetables, um, any vegetable except for potatoes and a few squash, like butternut squash, acorn squash that are higher in starch. All other vegetables um, are considered non-starchy. Um, you cannot eat too many in a day. They're at only 100 to 150 calories per pound. You can eat as many as you want. And so often, this is one thing that I ask people, how many vegetables are you eating now? And how can you eat more? Um, it is rare that somebody feels like they're eating, you know, a really high amount of vegetables. This is a great place to start 
for most people is just by increasing how many vegetables they eat in a day. Um, second on the calorie density scale is fruit at only 300 calories per pound. And again, researchers have put this to the test for weight to see if people eat 20 servings of fruit a day, do they gain weight? Does blood sugar go up? The answer is no. So um, of those dietary risk factors that are the leading cause of death in the United States, low fruit consumption is one. So most people are not eating more than one serving of fruit a day. And the more fruits that we consume, the lower our risk of cancer, the lower risk of diabetes, and certainly for weight loss, fruit is an excellent choice. Um, and time and time again, I'm hearing people say that they're avoiding fruit because they're afraid of the sugar. That is not at all based on research. Um, so I have the asterisk here just to point out that dried fruits are much, much higher in calorie density, 1,200 calories per pound because that water has been removed. So um, two cups of grapes, for example, have about the same calorie density as just a quarter cup of raisins. So which would fill you up more, two cups of grapes or a quarter cup of raisins? Uh, potatoes, um, also low in calorie density, another food that often people are shocked to hear are, are excellent choices for weight loss. They're packed with nutrients, really high in fiber. Um, and it's not the potatoes that are often the problem. It's all of the condiments. It's all of the high fat uh, butters and sour creams and cheese and bacon, all of those things that people add to potatoes that are the problem when it comes to weight. So all varieties of potatoes are wonderfully healthy and you know you should feel really good about including them in your diet. Uh, next is whole grains and I'm talking about oats and barley, wheat berries, quinoa, corn. There's a huge host of whole grains that are available in, in every grocery store these days and um, what you don't notice on this list are things like breads and crackers and dry cereals because those foods are more processed. They've had some of the fiber stripped away. They have less water content. They're higher in calorie density. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad foods or that they shouldn't or can't be included. Um, the less processing that is done to grain products, the lower the the calorie density, the more fiber, the more they're gonna fill you up, and the more vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants you'll uh, receive from those foods as well. So legumes, things like beans, lentils, peas, uh, are also low in calorie density and a food group that I can't say enough good about because on average Americans are eating very few of these foods. And there's lots and lots of research showing that they are um, amazingly healthy, that uh, compared to um, a calorie restricted diet in a study where people were asked to just eat five cups of, of beans or lentils a week and not change anything else, that, they, that those people saw just as great a lowering in waist circumference and blood glucose control as people who were cutting 500 calories a day. So, you know, it's always a good thing to add foods versus taking away. And if you are not currently eating uh, beans or lentils or peas, you know, it's, it's one group of foods that I seriously encourage you to think about adding. Um, the fiber in these foods really helps fill you up, and we know that that leads to fewer calories consumed at the end of the day, but again, you don't notice it because you're eating a larger volume of food, and so people aren't missing out. You're not feeling deprived when you're choosing more plant-based foods. So what does 14 grams of fiber look like? Well, that could be a cup of oatmeal with some berries and ground flax seeds, a one and a half to two cups of a lentil or vegetable stew, a cup of black bean and corn salad with a sweet potato. Any of those combinations is about 14 grams of fiber. And so just trying to give you some like real ideas of meals and foods that you can add to really boost up your fiber intake. Um, 
you know, as I mentioned earlier, achieving for at least 40 grams of fiber a day is a recommendation that I give based on lots of research studies. And on average, Americans are getting only 15 grams of fiber a day. So that's pretty pathetic. And, you know, if you're only going to focus on one component of food, which is not something I typically recommend, you know, it's really looking at the overall dietary pattern. But fiber is such a good indicator of, of a person choosing healthy foods that it can be something to, to pay attention to. And fiber is important for so many reasons. One is that it's the food for your good gut bacteria. So I mentioned that dysbiosis or, or um, having a, a microbiome, the, the bacteria, the microorganisms that in, uh, have it your large intestine, your colon are so, so, so important um, for reducing inflammation, for how you metabolize glucose, for achieving a healthy weight. You want to be creating a healthy microbiome by feeding the probiotic bacteria what they eat, and that's fiber. So a plant-based diet is so critical for achieving a healthy gut flora, and which in turn um, we know that people with cancer, we know people with diabetes, we know people who are overweight and obese, um, all of these different chronic conditions have a different microbiome than a healthy person. And so shifting the foods that you eat to create a more healthy uh, uh, microbiome really changes your health outcomes. And just to say a little bit about fat, like for weight loss in particular, because it is the densest source of calories, it can make a huge difference for weight um, when you think about the foods you're eating that are high in fat and then lowering your consumption of them. So fat is found in meats, it's found in eggs, it's found in processed foods like pizza that's loaded with cheese and pepperoni. Um, and in particular, the cheese is the number one source of saturated fat in the U.S. diet. Uh, oils so often um, make a huge difference for weight loss. Um, you know, we, we might read or be told that oils are healthy. Uh, they're totally void of nutrients. They are processed foods. And because they are so calorie dense and don't have the fiber and the nutrients, um, it, it makes a huge difference um, in weight and for reversing type 2 diabetes when you reduce your consumption of oil. They're certainly not something that anybody needs to be adding, thinking that they're, they're doing themselves a favor. Um, donuts are interesting, cookies, cakes. Um, often people will say to me that they have a sweet tooth, and when I ask, well, what do you mean? And they list, you know, these types of foods as things that they crave, um, the majority of calories in things like donuts and cake are coming from fat. And so again, um, because it is the densest source of calories, even small reductions in fat can make a really big difference for weight and certainly for reversing uh, type 2 diabetes. So it's interesting to see that as a percentage of calories, in general, your whole plant-based foods have fewer than 10% of their total calories coming from fat. So they're not fat free. We as humans get plenty of fat when we choose whole plant-based foods. Um, and it's in a percentage that's, that's really health promoting, whereas animal-based foods have a much greater percentage of calories coming from fat. And in particular, I like to point out that even the leanest, boneless, skinless chicken breast is not that far off from a lean cut of beef uh, in its percentage of calories coming from fat. So chicken is not at all a lean meat. And especially in today's day and age, like if we think about um, how our food is being produced, we are not uh, grazing animals anymore. 98% of the animals that we consume are raised um, on factory farms. And that's a whole, whole, whole lot different than animals that people consumed back in those days of hunting and gathering when animals were much leaner and, and were eating the diet that they were meant to eat too and not being pumped full of antibiotics um, and hormones. 
So for longevity, uh, there are places in the world that have been studied, they're called the blue zones that I have um, highlighted here. And the blue zones have the highest amounts of people who are 100 plus years old. And sadly, um, the, the person, Dan Buettner, who studied the Blue Zones and who's written multiple books on the Blue Zones, you know, is saying that in, in a number of, of decades, we won't have these Blue Zones anymore because our Western way of living is really being exported all over the world. Um, so what, what do these people, like if we study these populations where people live to be 100 plus years and are really um, thriving at those ages, they don't have the chronic diseases that we have in the United States, what are they doing in terms of diet? Um, they are eating predominantly plant-based, so 95 to 100 percent of, of all of these blue zones, while they may be eating different types of beans and different types of vegetables and fruits, depending on the type, uh, depending on the region of the world where, where they live, um, they're all eating predominantly plant-based foods. And they're also moving their bodies and they have strong uh, social connections and they're sleeping and all of these things are important. Um, so when it comes to food, I just want to leave on the note that it's not all or nothing. Um, that making small changes over time can add up to um, uh, optimal health that you can you know, for me, like really understanding the psychology of, of behavior change is, is fascinating. And for people to make long-term changes to their diet is, is what's important. And so, you know, some ideas or tips for maybe getting started is to just do an assessment at this, at this point in time, like think about how many beans you're eating, um, how many vegetables and fruits, like can you bump up the number of servings of fruit you eat in a day? Can you add in more beans by swapping one meat-based meal a week with a bean-based meal? Um, can you reduce your consumption of meat, whether it's by portion size or number of, of meals that contain meat in a day or in a week? Um, just a, suggestions. And there's all kinds of plant-based substitutes on the market these days uh, that might be a really good bridge for, for people to get started. And there's also tons of websites and apps that do meal planning and give you great recipes, or Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen is one that helps you really just focus on the types of foods you're eating in a day. Like, did you get three fruits today? Did you get some whole grains? And so these are some of the resources that I, um, share with with patients on a daily basis. All right, so that's the end of my slides and I'm happy to take questions at this at this time if anyone has them. Hey Karen, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, that was that was fantastic. That was great. Um, thank you so much. It looks like, um, I don't know if you can see the question and answer box, but um, uh -huh. Dr. Collins is asking, uh, relating to sodium intake, what um, about very active athletes that require more sodium to maintain normal blood and muscular electrolyte levels? Do you have any, um, any feedback? For yeah, that? sure. Um, if you are someone who exercises at that, like I would say very a uh, high level, like your sweat, especially if you're sweating a lot, then yes, absolutely. You might be able to include, or I would say, you know, even recommend having like an electrolyte uh, replacement drink um, during those times of activity is, is fine. And, you know, some of the recommendations that I provided today, like um, there are definitely individuals who you know, might have a different plan for sure. Like all of this can be individualized for your activity level, um, for your current health state. Um, and so today was more like giving a broad overview. But yes, if you are an active person, if you sweat a lot, then absolutely including an electrolyte um, substitute can be beneficial. 
but I definitely don't recommend them for people who are not exercising at a very intense level. They're just extra calories. You don't need them. Well, I know for a fact that Rob, uh, Rob's a pretty intense athlete, so he probably can afford to include a little bit more sodium into his, um, his caloric intake. Um, so Karen, next is um, uh, anonymous um, person is asking, what is your opinion on the Beyond Meat, the plant-based meat that is available now commercially? Yeah, so I think it is awesome from the standpoint that it is way less um, taxing <laughs> on our environment, right? Like, you know, if we consider some of the other factors of eating plant-based, like, you know, meat is just not a sustainable practice for the planet. And so Beyond Meat, Impossible Meats, like that's truly the, the mission of those companies is to create a more sustainable product. And they're really trying to win over meat eaters by making those products taste delicious, really mimic meat, and not so concerned about the, uh, you know, how much fat is in them. And, and so both of those products have a very high amount of fat. Um, and so I wouldn't say like there are foods that should be incorporated regularly, especially if weight loss is a goal, if diabetes reversal is a goal, they can definitely, um, you know, serve a place. Um, you know, if you're at a barbecue and you take your impossible burger, like that's awesome. Right, but um, they definitely have a high fat content. There are other plant-based burgers out there made from beans and whole grains or peas that are much lower in fat and you know, are, are whole foods. But for the people who are meat eaters and really want that taste, that's where those products are. You know, that's who they're marketing. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, uh, Amy is asking if you have a Facebook or Instagram account to follow. Can I, um, can I type those in here? Do you, you have a something? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Do you want me to, let's see, can I type in the chat? Facebook. Yeah, yeah, you can type in the so chat. So Instagram, um, is runs on plants RD. That's actually my website too. You left out the RD runs on plants RD. Oh shoot. I'm sorry. That's Karen. okay. No, that's okay. Um, that. you might find it that way. Any other questions? So a lot of people just said this was so great. Um, very eye-opening. Um, some people that commented to me on the side, thank you so much, this was excellent. So sounds like everybody really enjoyed it. Um, does anybody, anybody else have any questions before we go? Okay. Yeah, this is perfect. So Karen, any other resources that you can give? I know you're a big proponent of College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, any other yeah. kind of YouTube channels or anything to follow? Any other recommendations to get some more information on all this stuff? So definitely uh, nutritionfacts.org yes. is one of my favorites. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Nutritionfacts.org. Did I spell that right? There we go. Oh yeah, you typed it in too. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great place to start. You can go there and just search, like type in anything food related and you're going to get evidence-based information. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Forks Over Knives, the Plantrition Project, there are a lot. And I think I have some more listed on my website too. Yeah, the Forks Over Knives is really good. I know with my family especially, we've gotten a lot of great recipes off of that. Now, I'm not the cook myself, but my wife loves that website. And so we've, we've used a number of your kind of recommendations, Karen, as far as getting some recipes that uh, we have a lot of fun um, getting together and, and in the kitchen and, and cooking up these delicious meals. Awesome. Um, you will see, see certificates be emailed. Yes. So for everybody who's looking for the CE for the, for this course, um, again, we will be emailing everybody, um, the, uh, certificates, uh, probably within the next couple of days. I know the first one took a little bit longer cause it was our first one that we did via zoom. Um, but I, for this one, you, we should be able to get them out, um, here within the next couple of days. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Anybody else have any questions? 
awesome. Well, Karen, thank you so much. This was incredible. I hope everybody got as much out of it as I did. I know um, I've heard you speak a few times now and I've seen some of your slide decks, um, which are just, it's just eye opening every time I see it. So uh, thanks so much. And hopefully um, everybody got, you know, a ton out of it. Um, and then Laura said, what was the resource? Can someone type it in? Karen, what, what resource were we talking about? I'm not sure. Or, what. Oh, yeah. Oh, Nutritionfacts.org. You yeah, got it. Yeah. Laura, we typed that in just a little bit, a couple, couple chats above your, yep. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, so great. All right, guys. Well, um, hopefully we see you all back on Thursday for a fantastic um, pediatric sleep-related breathing disorders um, presentation. I will be giving the majority of that. Lauren, our oral facial myofunctional therapist, will be on for that as well. And I think everybody will get a ton out of that. If you have kids, if you know kids, if you treat kids in your practices, I think this is a must-see um, that you can't miss. So um, cool. If everybody, um, everybody, hope everybody's staying dry out there. It's raining where we're at. So everybody have a good day and we'll see you all on Thursday. Thanks very much, guys.